to pray about coming and being a part of our Immerse Bible Conference that we're going to be having uh, March 27th and 28th. We'll start on March 27th, that Friday evening, with a great revival service. So we want you to come and enjoy and join, uh, join us in revival. And then on the 28th, we'll start our breakout session. So we've got a list of them there in your bulletin, and they are... Uh, just some great classes, great breakouts. We've got some great teachers from around our area that are coming and going to share some things with you about immersing yourself in the Word of God. And then on the tw that evening, we'll come back and we'll have some great revival time uh, to close the, the conference out. So we want you to come and be a part of that time with us. But immerse uh, March 27th and 28th. You can register online. You can take the bulletin insert there and you can use your phone and, and, and uh, go right directly to our, our registration site or you can uh, join and, and register right after worship service if you want to do it with Linda. She'll be out there. So we just want to encourage you to come and be a part of Immerse uh, 2020. And I know God is going to really go bless us uh, through this time. Now before the kids leave, uh, I do want to, last week I forgot to do this because I was wearing my pizza socks and the pizza socks, I'll, bring, I'll wear them again one day in the next couple of weeks, but my pizza socks were so comfortable compared to all the others, I forgot I was wearing different socks, amen? But today I've got socks that remind me every movement that I'm wearing something different. So let me go ahead and reveal you today what the, the socks are, and today I'm wearing my basketball socks. There you go. So uh, to all the young people who made the basketball socks, I forgive you, but thank you. All right. <laughs> they are great. And again, we got to raise some money for, uh, for our missions. So we're excited about that and excited about what God is going to do. And thank you for being a part of that. So for our, our, all of our kids, kindergarten, first and second graders, Miss Carrie is back there in the back. You may be dismissed. And uh, we will be seeing you uh, here very shortly. But again, it's good to have all of you here with us today. And, and I know some of you uh, may be a little tired from the lack of or the one hour of sleep that you didn't get. But hey, you can go home after lunch and take a nap. Amen? Amen. And if, if somebody complains, say, hey, the pastor even said we can take a nap today, man. So enjoy your nap time before you come back tonight for Will Snacks in our, our Bible studies, all right? So today we're going to be continuing on with getting people to Jesus. That's the whole the theme that God has laid on my heart for this series of messages, is getting people to Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 18 through 20, what we've all deemed the Great Commission. And we're going to be looking at why we have this and, and how we are to, as a church, honor and glorify God through this time. So let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came to and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you, and God, we thank you for the great time of praise and worship that we just experienced. And Father, I pray that everybody here and everybody on, on, on this uh, live stream, Father, was able to just truly express ourselves to you and for what you've done for us, and to, to give you honor through the singing. <clears throat> and now, Father, as we look into your word, I pray that you, you would use it as an encouragement to us. The Father, to let us realize our goal is to bring people to you. And so, Father, we pray for the rest of this hour that your spirit would be speaking to us, encouraging us, calling those who may not even know you, that, Lord, they could be saved today. Father, I pray as always that the words I say today will not be my words, but your words. I pray, Father, that this is not my message, but yours as well. And Lord, I pray that the response would be as you desire for it to be. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. 
as we look, and the, the title to my message today is just simply, Go. Go. That's what we're uh, encouraged by Jesus here in this text, is to just go. And that's, that's the emphasis that we have here at First Baptist West through this series of messages. And throughout the rest of this year, as we're looking at bringing people to Jesus, it's the idea of just going and, and honoring and glorifying God. John MacArthur once said this, If a Christian understands all the rest of the Gospel of Matthew but fails to understand this closing passage, he has missed the point of the entire book. This passage is the climax and major focal point, not only of this gospel, but the entire New Testament. That we can understand a whole lot of stuff that's going on. But listen, if we miss this last phrase of what Jesus was telling them in the book of Matthew, then we miss all of it because this is the climax. This, this is what we are supposed to be about. Amen? As Christians, as a church, this right here is the crux of everything. Now we talk about, well, we're, we're, our, our, main goal here is, our main goal is to worship. Our main goal is this. And we give a lot of things out. And then we'll be talking about those a little bit more next week. But the idea of what Jesus deals with us here is the fact of, the entire spectrum of what we're supposed to do is to be reaching people for Jesus. Go and make disciples. That's what he wants us to do. And the reason we do it is the first thing I want us to look at is God's desire has always been to bring sinful men back to himself. Do you understand that? That's what God wants from us. That's what God desires. His heart is for the lost. Amen? His desire is to bring people into that saving relationship with him through Jesus Christ. So what I want us to understand today is he wants every person to be saved. Amen? Not just a select few. He wants every person. It is God's will that all people come to know Jesus. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I've emphasized that emphasis of all in the scripture that you're reading is mine. That all people, his goal, his desire, his heart is for all people. As a matter of fact, he is tearing now to give every person an opportunity. He says that he wants the gospel to be presented around the world. Go around the world. Go to everybody and and preach the message of Jesus to them so that I can have a chance. I want all people to be saved. And he said, I don't want people to be considering my slackness as some do, like I don't care or like I'm not here anymore. He said, my goal is to bring every person to repentance. And I'm giving every person that, uh, that opportunity. It's not like God is standing over us, looking at us and saying, boy, you know what? I just can't wait for you to mess up. As a matter of fact, we talk about it a lot, don't we? When somebody messes up, we say, "Woo, you better watch out. God's going to strike you. Thinking that that's God's goal. God's goal is to get people. Do you understand that's not his goal? God is not watching over us waiting to zap someone. God is not looking and waiting for that last moment where he can go, finally, man, I can bring judgment on these rascals. Man, they've been so bad. I am so ready. I've just been waiting. And man, I can't wait to send them off and separate them from me for an eternity. That's not what God is doing. God is waiting. God is desiring for everybody to come to repentance. That's, he says, I'm holding off. I'm holding off my judgment. Because I want, I'm showing my grace to everybody so that they might then receive my mercy. But when they reject, then they, will re they basically reject my mercy. And he says, and listen, that doesn't please God. That is not what God wants. 1 Timothy 2 says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Can you see here today the heart of God? He wants people to know the truth. And he is calling upon the church. He is calling upon you and me to go out and tell that truth. To not hide it. To not put it away. To not be embarrassed by it. He says, I want you to go out and 
tell the truth because it is his desire for all people to be saved. And I want to tell you the second thing is God is glorified by man's redemption. Amen? God is glorified by that. He is glorified when someone comes to know him. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says this. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. He says, if you really want to glorify me, church, if you really want to glorify me, bring people to me. Because it's through man's redemption to God that he is most glorified. The Bible says he is so glorified that even the angels in heaven rejoice when one lost sinner comes to repentance. He said that's what brings him glory. So I want to look at very quickly, why is it that God gets glory? To have someone to know him, to turn to him, shows something. And this is how it brings him glory. First of all, when a person comes to repentance, the first thing it does is it shows God's sovereignty. When a person realizes they're separated from God, and they turn and repent, him, repent of their sin, and they come to him and receive Jesus, what they're doing is they're basically coming to God, and they're saying, God, you have the authority. The authority is yours. You are supreme, God. It's not mankind. It's not the planet. It's not the galaxy, the systems. It's you, God. You are sovereign. You are Lord. My friend, listen to me. That's what God wants to hear from his creation. You are Lord. You are God. Not only does it show his sovereignty, but when a man repents, and by man, I'm meaning man and woman, boy, girl, but when he repents or she repents what it also does is show God's love because God loves us enough that when while we were yet sinners that he didn't turn his back on us that he said I still want you and I love you so much as the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life when a man a woman, boy, or girl comes to repentance, they're, they're acknowledging God's love. That God said, I will pay the price for you. Greater love is no man than they lay down their life for a friend. So when we are glorifying God, we're glorifying him by acknowledging his, his love. But also acknowledges man's humility. When a person comes to Jesus... They can't come on their own things. They can't come and say, here's my demands. I will come to you if. I will come to you because. But it's just the fact of coming to God saying, look, God, I can't do it on my own. I humble myself before you. I, I am not righteous. I am not good. I am none of this. I am not worthy to be in your presence. So, God, I humble myself before you today. Man, we, should, we, all, we glorify God when we realize who he is in comparison to us. My friend, listen to me. The world has now switched that comparison. If they even acknowledge God, what they're acknowledging, what they will acknowledge is, okay, if there is God, then we are supreme. We, it is our will, it is our desire. We have the ability to save the planet. We have the ability to do this. We have the ability to do that. Listen, my friends, when we stand before the Almighty God, what we are acknowledging to Him is, God, we don't control any of this. It brings us to a place of humility. But not only humility, then, but of admiration. It brings us, we, we glorify God when we admire Him. When we're in awe of Him. When we're, when we're amazed by Him. When we begin to sing about that amazing grace, when we're amazed by the grace that he shows us, man, it brings this. Let me ask you a question. Most questions I say, you don't have to answer this out loud or you don't have to raise it, but I just want you to think about it. But here I want you to really, I just want you to do it. Raise your hand if you remember and you appreciate God saving you. If you remember when you were saved and you really, man, you go, wow, that was cool. All right, thank you. What you just did, do you realize what you just did by even raising your hand? You were glorifying God because you were showing him admiration. God, thank you. Even in a Southern Baptist church, we raised our hands saying thank you. Woo! 
Now, I know some of us do it. Some of you don't do it, but you just did it. Amen? You raised your hand in admiration to God. Thank you, Lord. Yes, I remember being lost. Yes, I remember that you saved me. And I admire you, God. I thank you for it. Do you see why God receives glory when a repentant soul turns to him? Because we are acknowledging his sovereignty, him being God. That we are admiring, we, we, we're talking about his love and how much he, as that God who could do anything he wanted, that he loved us enough that he sent Jesus to die. We're acknowledging our humility, our lack of ability to save ourselves. It's not about my work. It's not about my being good. It's not about my preaching. It's not about anything. It's about him loving me that he sent Jesus for me. And then we admire him. We show him that, God, thank you. Oh, thank you. Man, when we show up here and worship in the mornings, do you realize that's what this worship is supposed to be about? Honestly, that's what worship is. Worship is just saying, God, thank you. Oh, thank you for what you've done for me. So we look and we see that God's desire for is every person to be saved. And he's always had a goal of bringing sinful man back to himself. So if God is glorified, when a sinful man repents and comes back to him, then if we as the church want to really glorify him, we will glorify God when we go. Because what we're then doing is showing him that we understand who we are, we understand what he's done, and we understand what his goals are, what his purpose is, is for men to come to him, then we glorify him most when the church is a going church. You notice I didn't say growing. I said a going church. When we leave from here on our worship time, and we go from here, and then we begin to live our lives pleasing to God, representing him, declaring him to the world, we are then bringing glory to him because we are doing exactly what he has called us to do. He tells us to go. So about this goal, a couple things very quickly that I want us to look at. First of all, it is assuming we will. When this text is here, this text, we sometimes read it, and I've, I've even heard it taught, well, this is a command by God telling you to go. No, if we actually read the way it's written and we understand what it was truly meant, he's basically saying, as you are going, because here's what's happening. Jesus is assuming that because we realize that we've been lost, and lost is not good, amen? Lost is, lost is bad, saved is good. Got it? And we realize how bad it was, but now how good we have it, that we will be so excited about it that we couldn't help but now want to go and show it. We, he's saying, how could you take that which was given to you, that grace that was bestowed upon you through Jesus, and the mercy that you received, that you're not going to suffer the condemnation, and you should be really, listen, we should be really, really happy about that, amen? Because not only is lost bad, it's really, really, really bad, and not only is saved good, it is really amazing, amen? So what he's saying is that you are now saved and I am going to go now with the thought that since you know what it is and you know how good it is and you know how bad it is for those who are lost, I'm assuming that you're going to go. So he says, as you go or as you are going, he's saying it's not a matter of having to go. As you are going is not saying, I make you go. I command you to go. I'm telling you, you better get up and you better get out and you better go tell. Listen, where is showing appreciation? Where is glorifying that if I have to do? Well, okay, God, if I have to, I guess I don't want to, but I have to. I'll go out and I'll kick the ground and tell someone, yeah, yeah you need Jesus. I guess. Oh, I, I don't like it, but why, why don't you just come to church? I may not be there, but you, you'll enjoy it. 
You see what I'm talking about? This isn't a command. It's an understanding of how we should view it. Go. As you are going, doing these things for me, bring me glory and honor. So it's not a matter of having to go, and it's not a matter of convenience. It's not a matter of, of, well, God, you know, this really just isn't a good time. I'm kind of busy here, God. I kind of got my life to live, and... I tell you what, God, if you will hold off on this going issue until I get this done, then I will go. Or if you will wait until let me go back to my family, let me talk to them, and and then when I get my family raised, then I will go. Or God, if you will just hold off. You know, I think there's a story in there, in the scripture that talks about that. Amen? God, if you'll just, I want to follow you, I want to go, but if you'll just wait. Jesus told him, said, no, man, I want you to be going. I want your heart to be for me. I want your heart to be for those who are lost. Man, I want you to want to go. Not a matter of convenience. It says be instant, in season and out of season. Man, when it's not a good time, just like Keith was talking about a while ago, when we're in those dark times, you know what? We're still to be going. When we're in those dark times and we don't know what's lying ahead of us, <clears throat> maybe we're not feeling real good. Maybe, maybe things aren't going the way I want them to. He says, I still want you to be going. Don't wait until the sun comes up. I want you to be going. Why? Because we know what he's done for us. The love of Christ compels me. That compel is not forcing, it's guiding. Man, it's just because I love him so much and I realize what he's done for me, I can't help but go. I can't help but go. So it's assured, it's assumed we will. The second one, we are told to not wait on the world. Don't wait on the world. He says, I want you to go. I want you to be the ones going out. He said, man, don't just sit in the church and wait for them to show up. Don't just say, hey, we have services. Put on the sign out there, service times, come join us. He said, don't wait on the world. He said, I want you to go. In other words, he says, I want you to seek those who are lost. Jesus even said, I have come to seek and to save those which were lost. In other words, he went looking. Last week, when we talked about Philip and Nathaniel, Philip went looking for Nathaniel. He found him. My friends, listen, we ought to be leaving from here energized, taught, disciplined, to where now our purpose when we leave out of here today is to be looking for that one. Looking for whoever it is that God has placed on your heart. Looking for an opportunity that God may bring somebody in front of you. And again, it's not that you've got to tell them the whole gospel, tell them all about every book in the Bible. It's just tell them what God has done for you. Show them some encouragement. And then here's the cool thing we even talked about last week. Just tell them, come see. Why don't you come to church and see? Come to our revival and see. Come be a part of that. But we can't wait on the world to come to us. We must be the aggressor. We must be the ones to step out and to go. And here's the cool thing. I want to close with this part. He says, as you are going, go make disciples. He says, as you're going, you will be effective. Amen? There is never an opportunity that you've lived for Christ, that you've shared something, that it wasn't effective. And you say, well, I didn't lead them to the Lord. They didn't show up to church. Well, but I tell you what, you planted a seed. Remember, Paul said not all of us will be harvesters. He said some will plant the seed. Anytime you go out and you live for Christ and you glorify him by letting people know and you tell them to come see, man, you planted a seed. That's going to be effective. Maybe you're the waterer. Maybe you are going to go and somebody else has already planted a seed in their life and in their heart and you go to them and you begin to share what Christ has done for you. Or maybe you just begin to encourage them say, man, I'm sorry you're going through a difficult time. Can, I want to pray for you. Man, you're, you're, now you're watering. But then maybe you will get to be the one 
who you've been praying for and watering and someone else had maybe planted seeds. Somebody else has watered, but then you men, you walk up to them and they're ready. They're ready for the harvest. You will be effective. Because he tells us to go and be effective by making disciples. Go make a disciple. Do you know what the first step of making a disciple is? Convert them. We think discipleship is taking that which has been saved and growing it. But do you understand something can't grow if it hasn't been saved? So the first step to us is to convert them. Now I know in our day in society that uh, is kind of a bad word, proselytization. Don't, don't you proselyte anyone. You can't go out and tell a Jewish person they need to be saved. You can't go out and tell an, uh, uh, an Islamic person they need to be saved. How are you going to convert them? Because <laughs> you listen to me. If they don't believe in Jesus, they're not going to be saved by what they're doing. Amen? So the first step of making a disciple is to tell them of Jesus, to to bring them to Christ, let them receive him, and you convert them. Then you teach them. you got to convert by sharing Christ, and then you teach them. Teach them what God has told us to do. Teach them the things of, of growing as a Christian. But here's the cool thing. We will be effective if we do it, no, no doubt. He says, as you're going, make it. Do it. Because you will be there. And he says, and here's how I know. You know how I know he's going to do it? You know how I know we're going to be successful? Because he says, and lo, I'm with you always. You're not doing this by yourself. I'm doing the work. Remember last week I told you. When Philip told Nathaniel, come see. All he did was tell him, come see. I found Jesus. I found the answer. I found the cure. All you got to do is, is, is receive him. Well, I don't believe anything good come out of Nazareth. Hey, well, then just come see. And man, once he got there, Jesus, you know what happened? Remember, Jesus went to work. Here's the cool thing. You honor and glorify God by living for him and sharing what God wants you to share and showing people Jesus. And then he said, then you step back and let me do the work because I'm going to be with you. And anytime Jesus is working, he's effective. Do you want to be a part of an effective church? you want to be a part of a church that's honoring and glorifying God? Man, be a going church. You can't hide in here, folks. Hmm. You can't hide it in here. You can't, you can't put it on and put a coat over it and walk out of here and not be the light, not be the salt. He said, man, you're light of the world. A light on the hill cannot be hidden. Be the light. Be the salt. And when you are, you will be bringing God great glory. You'll be glorifying his name. If you understand a whole lot of things about the Bible, but you miss this part, my friend, you've missed the very best part of how we are to glorify God. Go. Go. Because if God's desire is for all men to be saved and he is glorified by that, then the best way for the church to show him glory is to go. So here this morning... If you're sitting here today and, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you this morning. If you can't sit here and say, I know beyond a doubt, I know that I'm saved because there was a moment of time of my life where I realized I was lost. I knew I needed Jesus and I called on his name and I asked him to forgive me my sin. I asked him to save me. My friend, if that point of time has never been in your life, then I encourage you to make it today. Make it now. It's that simple. I need you, Jesus. Would you call on his name this morning? What a shame it would be to be here, to be watching this today and feeling, knowing that this is the way, knowing this is happening, knowing this is what God is wanting, but yet you walk out of here or you turn off the, the TV or computer and you just ignore it. Oh, what a shame. 
Because you cannot be saved by any other means other than Jesus. And God has a will for you today that you be saved. He even so wills it to such an extent that he sent Jesus to die for you to do that. And he's with you, calling you. Would you come? Maybe you hear and you say, Pastor, you know, we talk about this going. I just, I don't know that I ever felt that. Then I, I would encourage you at this moment, find out what's wrong. Because if you realize what Christ has done for you and you've received it, our hearts ought to be now willing and ready to be going as we're going now. But maybe you hear and you say, well, I, I, I want that in my heart. Then just commit it to him. Say, God, here I am. I realize today what you've done. And I realize how much you love me. And I realize how lost people are and what, it, what, what they need in their lives. God, I come to you today. I surrender that to you. You have the opportunity here now in Jesus' name. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that you call us. And I believe, Lord, there may be someone to hear today, someone watching this, that, Lord, you've called this morning. I pray that they will call upon your name and receive you into their lives. And, God, they will bring you the best glory they've ever brought you. The angels in heaven will even rejoice. Father, maybe someone watching this program is sensing a need of you that, God, today they would just, right there where they are, call upon your name, seek forgiveness of sin, and to claim you as the Lord. To be forgiven. And then, Father, I pray for every person that's saved, that, Lord, we would have a heart. We would have a heart for you, God. And today, we would be going. God, we could be inviting Father, we could be living a life that's pleasing. We could be helping and encouraging. That we could be going and making disciples. My friend, as we are here at this moment, we're going to enter back into time of praise and worship. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and, and sing. Pray, give him praise through this time. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you to call on him right now. Maybe you already have, then I want to encourage you to, to let us know. Either coming forward or, or after church, come and see me. If you're, if you're watching the live stream, then contact us through the church office. Man, let us know. We want to, we want to celebrate with you. Maybe here you're saying, gosh, I, I, want to, I, want, I want to be telling people. I want to be going. Today I commit to going. Maybe you need to come and pray for somebody, whatever it is. As we step back into praise and worship, would you come? Father, hear our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Join back. I'm Harold Gacious, pastor of First Baptist West. I want to thank you for watching our service today and hope that you were able to feel the God's Spirit moving as we were able to here. And I want to always invite you to join us in person. If you're within driving distance, come and join us and we can worship together. But if not, continue to watch us in our live stream service as we will now, over the next few weeks, continue to be preaching on bringing people to Jesus. Our goal is to make the church aware of the need that people have around us uh, for, for Jesus. And so that our hope is to bring people to that saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are needing anything that we can help you with, just please call us here at the church office, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to visit with you in any way that we can, help you in any way that we can. So we always want to welcome you and be a, be a loving church. And remember, at First Baptist West, we're people that love God, love people, and we want to see lives changed.